Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host Craig, and I recently had the pleasure of talking to Carlos Cisco, a staff writer on Star Trek Discovery who co-wrote the mid-season finale, But to Connect. We discuss getting into writing, his Star Trek fandom education, and being Gonzo's dog walker. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. So I'm delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with Carlos Cisco, writer on, among other things, Star Trek Discovery. Welcome on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's a little bit cold. Snow is predicted. I don't want to say that it is also a little bit cold in sunny Los Angeles, but it is a balmy like 55 degrees. And so we're all dying here. Los Angeles makes us very soft very quickly. <laughs> What's that in Celsius? I don't really do Fahrenheit. Oh, uh, I don't know the conversion, but it's well above freezing. But it's not comfortable for Los Angeles because we don't have any real insulation in our walls here. Fair enough. Anyway, enough about the weather. Let's talk about you. Let's just start with right at the beginning. How did you get into the world of writing for television and film? In undergrad, I studied theater. And I wanted to be an actor originally, and then it didn't really work out in college for me, which is fine. I think I'm much happier for that, though I would say that the life of a writer is not much happier in general than the life of an actor out here. But that notwithstanding, I had a teacher that told me when she read one of my monologues that she's like, I think you're uh, a writer, not an actor. And I was like, fine, <laughs> great. <laughs> so it kind of just went from there. And I, I went to grad school at Florida State. And it was a really cool like dual degree program where we studied film and television one semester and playwriting another semester. And then we would switch off. And so I eventually concentrated in television writing and then pretty much moved to LA straight after grad school and started just climbing up that really, really long and seemingly endless ladder. I started out as an intern at uh, a production company at Sony and as a reader for several screenwriting competitions, which that was not a fun job. Pretty much did that, kicked around LA doing just odd jobs. I was Gonzo's dog walker for a period on the set of The Muppet. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was strange, but it was great. I basically got to sit up in Dave Gold's dressing room, hang out with his neurotic little dog, and I was just writing up there. And anytime I wanted, I could walk down and get craft services and watch the Muppets being filmed. It was pretty magical for a job that didn't pay very well. I eventually left LA because I was broke. And my friend was on sabbatical teaching. So I went and filled in for her and I taught screenwriting and TV writing at New Mexico State University. And while I was there, just to say sort of connected to the industry, I was pulling in my friends and contacts, producers, writers and stuff like that to fill gaps in my knowledge, because at that point I hadn't even been in a room. So what the hell did I know about teaching television writing other than what I learned in grad school. After that semester, I moved back out to LA and I was kind of doing the rounds of, hey, I'm back and need a job or I'll die. And I ended up meeting with a woman who I knew from my first internship. She was uh, working at the charity arm of that production company and we'd stayed friends. And she was now a development executive at Wise Entertainment. And they were producing Eastless High at the time. And they had just finished their second season and were going into their third season. And their writer's assistant was being promoted to staff writer. And they're like, I can't make any guarantees, but I'll put you in contact with her. And we hit it off. She's one of my best friends. She's actually my neighbor. Like, 40 feet. Well, your podcast listeners can't see it, but about 40 feet away from me. <laughs> she lives just across the way. But she got me in as a writer's assistant on Eastless High, where I had my first co credit. And that got me an associate membership in the WGA, which is basically a membership light. You don't get any of the real benefits. You get real benefits, but you don't get like the real benefits. Like, insurance. But you can go to guild screenings, you can join the diversity committees, you can sit in on meetings. So it's actually a really great networking tool and sort of leads to very strangely and indirectly to Star Trek Discovery. After that, I was a writer's assistant on another show called Teresa, which never made it to air, but it was with the same producer that did Isos High. And then after that, I was in kind of a fallow period for a good three or four years. Nothing was really moving forward. My rep at the time was really dropping the ball. I was like, all right, is this it? I was working at a terrible for-profit university, really just miserable. And during that time, I had started playing Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop RPGs again, which was something I had done a lot when I was younger, but I had kind of stopped for whatever reason. So I picked it back up and that'll come into play in a second. So I saw a job posting 
for a narrative designer at Wizards of the Coast, which is the company that makes Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, what the hell? Nothing is going right here right now. Why not just shoot my shot, pivot? I have skills in the TV film realm. I don't know what they were looking to do or what that the thing was, but it seemed like they were looking to expand media at the time. So I, I ended up interviewing with them and it seemed to go really well. The Christmas holiday was coming up and I was going home to visit my folks. And I got an email from Michelle Paradise, who I had never met before, and was like, hey, so I'm the incoming showrunner on Star Trek Discovery Season 3. Do you want to apply to be a writer's assistant? And in my head, I'm like, is this a fucking joke? Who does that? Who just emails someone out of the blue to invite them to apply to one of the most desirable jobs for up-and-comers in the industry? So, of course, I was like, yes. And in my head, I'm sweating because at the time, I had seen the JJ movies. I had seen Voyage Home back in like fifth grade. And I had seen like a handful of next gen episodes. So I was like, I'm not qualified for a franchise like Star Trek. So I send off my resume and writing sample and I'm like, well, it's out there. I don't know. We'll see. And I ended up interviewing after the break with Michelle. It was great. It turns out we have a ton of mutual friends and people that we've worked with and stuff before. And it was it was just a really great interview. I ended up calling one of my friends right afterwards that had worked with her on Vampire Diaries, who was a close friend from grad school. He called her up, gave me a great reference. Monday of not that week, but like two weeks later, I got a call from Wizards being like, hey, sorry, we enjoyed your interview, but no thanks. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, well, what can I do in the meantime, you know, in case this comes up again? And they're like, oh, well, maybe try like self-publishing some stuff on the DMs Guild or trying to write some adventures and get them online, whatever. Didn't seem like they were that interested in giving me any sort of advice. So I was like, oh, that's a bummer. And then that Friday, I get a call from Michelle that's like, hey, do you want to start in two weeks? I was like, yeah. And so I immediately quit my job at the shitty for-profit university. Didn't burn my bridges there, but I might as well have because I'm never going back ever. They're like, well, you know, we would love it if you could give us a couple weeks notice. And I was like, mm, no, they want me next week, which was a lie. But I just wanted two weeks vacation before I started work on a show, which I knew would be quite difficult. So started on Star Trek. That's kind of the journey to discovery. So again, I came in sort of sweating. I don't know any of this stuff. I'm still surprised that I made it through day one when Alex Kurtzman was in the room and I asked a question. And I accidentally called the Federation the Empire. <laughs> I was certain I would not have a job after that day, but things kept working out. And one of my coworkers, who is kind of like my direct mentor in the room, because he had been a writer's assistant the previous season during season two and was promoted to staff writer. So I was like, well, clearly I want to model myself after this guy who's moving up. But that's uh, Brandon Schultz, who wrote 406 with Anne Cofell Saunders. We were talking a lot about Orions and Andorians. And he was like, I was doing some reading. And he's like, the Orions and Andorians are featured most heavily in Enterprise, which was, for various reasons, kind of the gap in the room. And so I was like, all right. I'll watch Enterprise. I was already starting to work through Next Gen. I had gotten like three seasons into Next Gen and then I pivoted to Enterprise. And I have mixed feelings on Enterprise. I think that I, in the past year, two years, I've really actually grown to appreciate some of the stabs that it was taking, but it was clear it was on a network that didn't know what to do with it at the time. And that ending, man, I feel so bad for that cast. They deserve so much better than that. But I found some like truly bright spots. I was always a Jeffrey Combs fan. I'm a huge horror guy growing up. And so the discovery that Jeffrey Combs is so deeply embedded in Star Trek across two series. It was such a joy for me. And Shran, I think, is the best part. When people ask me, what are your favorite episodes of Enterprise? And I'm like, oh, I have 10 favorite episodes and all of them have Jeffrey Combs in them. <laughs> so I ended up being the guy who was most, in terms of how we were talking about the Orions, I had the most context. The Orions and the Andorians in season three, as we were talking about them, I was the one with the most context. So I became kind of the go-to guy. I remember there was even one point after we had wrapped and Michelle calls me up and she's like, hey, I wanted you to talk to our composer because they're writing an Andorian opera to be recorded. And I know there was something about how many genders there were. And so could you talk it? And so I ended up just talking Andorian deep lore with one of our composers so that he could <laughs> compose an Andorian opera. And it was nice. wild. So after I finished Enterprise, I finished Next Gen. I blazed through Deep Space Nine, which is now, I've watched it twice. It's one of my favorite series of all time. And then by season four of Voyager, I burnt out. I couldn't watch any more Star Trek while I was working on Star Trek. Because I was literally 
at work 12-ish hours a day, and then I would come home or start my mornings watching an episode of Star Trek, just because I was like, there's 700 something episodes to get through this. <laughs> this is a very dedicated and passionate fan base. I need to know my shit. I want to know things about the thing that I'm working on. I'm a big researcher and a completionist when I play video games. So for me, it became kind of the goal was I need to really understand what makes this franchise click for people, what makes it special, why it resonates for so many people and for so long. And by watching all of it, you really get a good idea of that. Now, I still have a hard time with episode titles because it's all blended together for me. I can think of more of like giant arcs or storylines, but oftentimes I get them a little muddled because again, I watched 700-ish episodes of Star Trek in a year <laughs> while also working <laughs> on it's it. It's impressive. And it was a lot. So during the year as a writer's assistant, I started running more games and stuff like that. Like with D&D, I ended up running a game for The Room. And the woman who wrote the adventure that I ran for The Room ended up putting out a call for pitches for a explicitly anti-capitalist collection of D&D adventures. And so... I ended up pitching to that. I got in. And so that sort of started me on, it was sort of just a lark kind of. I just wanted to do it to see if I could do it. And it seemed like fun, but I've sort of developed a sort of side career that was really great to have in hiatuses and stuff like that, because I've been able to publish several adventures. I have some gazetteers. I've been working with people in the tabletop industry to adapt independent properties to film. So it's really kind of opened up a whole world for me. I can't talk more than obliquely about it, but I have some stuff coming up in Star Trek Adventures at some point. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And then general nerd audience, there's generally a cross-pollination. I got some stuff coming up in Arcadia again, which is Matt Coville's D&D magazine. So that's sort of the melange that I'm in. And then season four, we came in during Zoom which was very difficult, a very hard transition. Also, there was not insignificant things going on in the world at the time that made things, I think, increasingly difficult to be creative during that year. But I came back as a writer's assistant, which I can say full confidence, even if anybody on the show listens to this, that it was very disappointing coming back as a writer's assistant. I was glad to be back during the pandemic, but coming back as a writer's assistant, I mean, no writer's assistant wants to be a writer's assistant after the first season, I think. It's the hardest job in the room outside of the showrunner. And any writer who tells you differently is lying to you. The support staff on shows, they're so dedicated and they are so hardworking. And I cannot, especially on our show, I cannot give enough shout outs to them. Eric, Mariana, Dan, Andrea, Ari are all incredible. They're all incredible storytellers. And I just hope that they can all move up with us. But anyways, that notwithstanding, that's shout out to our support staff. We're incredible. So I came back as a writer's assistant. And a couple months into the season, one of our writers went on paternity leave. And instead of bringing in someone new from the outside, we'd have to catch up. Michelle decided to promote me from the inside, which was incredible. It was completely unexpected. Me and Eric had submitted samples. Eric's the other writer's assistant at the time. He was the co-writer of 404, All is Possible. But we were vying for what we thought was the only co-write of the season. We had both submitted samples and Michelle surprised us by giving him the co-write and then giving me a staff job. Also got a co-write. So it was pretty incredible and very unexpected because mid-season promotions, I've never heard of it happening. I can't think of a single instance where I've heard that. I'm sure it has. It has to have happened before, <laughs> but I've never known anyone to. So that was very special and humbling and terrifying. Because there was no transition. It was kind of hard to get out of the writer assistant headspace because I was sitting at the same desk in the same place at home. Nothing had changed. I didn't have an office, which I would have if I was a writer. I wouldn't be sitting at the big kids table instead of at my small writer assistant desk. It was all just sort of the same. So it was a weird cognitive dissonance to the whole thing. But I mean, it was still the most amazing year of my life. It opened incredible doors for me. I got to write with Terry, who is an incredible co-writer and mentor through the whole process. The episode itself, writing was a tough one because we didn't get to go to set because of the COVID restrictions. So we were sent to set like Futurama Head in a Jar 
<laughs> we were carried around on an iPad by a poor PA who had to do that. I feel so bad for them. So I ended up having to, because of just a lot of scheduling stuff, not having to, getting to produce at least partially episodes one and two during the initial production run of them. And just the way everything worked out, the day that I started on set was the day that I went off to write my episode, which was also the week of the 2020 presidential election here in America. Some week. <laughs> Yeah, it was rough. I called Ann Kofel Saunders, I don't know, a couple days into it, losing my mind at one point. Like I hadn't showered in two days. I had <laughs> eaten like 36 hours. It was all bad for me. But she definitely talked me off a ledge, bless her. And so that's just sort of finished up season four. And that's where we're kind of at now. I was home with my folks over the holidays. My parents are divorced, but they all have a good relationship. So it was all four of them together. It's great. But it's also a lot. But it was really amazing because they have all been very supportive of me during this entire journey, even when I was kind of a bummer during those kind of fallow periods, dark times. But they were all there. My cousins were there. I had some close family friends from childhood that were there that all got to sit there and watch the episode with me. And it was really special to get to do that. That's not something I've gotten to do before. Even when my episode aired, because I had a co write on East Coast High, when that aired, I was in my room alone on the phone, watching it with Omira over the phone and laughing. It didn't feel like this, seeing my name up there as the writer, but also knowing that I'm a staff writer and all that. So it was, it was very cool. Yeah. So that's uh, brings us to now. Yeah. It's interesting to see that being a huge fan is not a prerequisite for being among the writers. That's something I wouldn't have necessarily expected. But no, it's interesting that it's it's not one of those, if you're not familiar with every part of Star Trek, don't bother applying. Uh, I find that quite an interesting, quite an open thing because it gives you so many different perspectives, potentially. Yeah. And I think Michelle's thinking, I think she was really trying to get a room that hadn't had opportunities like this before. And it's how she's continued hiring. And I think a lot of minorities have not always seen, some have seen themselves in Star Trek, but some haven't. And it's taken us until discovery for gay people and queer people in general to be seen in Star Trek. And so for me, I'm glad that it was an opportunity that was afforded to me. And I feel like for my part, I did the work to earn it on the back end. I wasn't going to go into this thing blind because I know that this is the franchise that created fandom as we know it. Star Wars, Marvel, all of those things would not exist without Star Trek fandom and the sort of power that it's held. And so I wanted to do right by that because I understand I'm passionate about things that I care about too. And I want people to care about them as much as I do. And so... I made it my goal to care about this franchise as much as the fans do. Was your lack of exposure just more of a, wasn't in your sort of wheelhouse growing up? Oh no, I'm a huge genre fan. I'm a sci-fi horror guy all the way, but I didn't have TV growing up in the 90s. So I miss Next Gen, I miss Deep Space Nine, I miss Voyager. The only thing I had when I was like living with my dad, my mom would record episodes of The Simpsons. And so I would watch The Simpsons and Futurama, King of the Hill, the Fox primetime lineup, X-Files, whatever was in that kind of two-hour block. But that was it. That was kind of the exposure to TV that I had. But I watched movies. And so I had seen most of the Star Trek movies and I enjoyed them eventually. But it was always a franchise that intimidated me because it felt so inaccessible because at the time I'm not going to get VHS tapes of Star Trek. It's like $30 a tape <laughs> and they would have two episodes on them. And then DVDs, it wasn't a, a franchise that I grew up with or had nostalgia for. So it wasn't something I was actively collecting. And I didn't have a lot of friends that really grew up around or that grew up really following Star Trek. I think I might have had like one or two. So I think it was largely just due to lack of exposure, because as soon as I started watching it, I was like, I feel robbed. This is a show I wish I had growing up. Because there's so many great lessons about life. There's so many fascinating philosophies at play. Deep Space Nine is still the most prescient show that has ever aired. It's terrifying. I dove in because I felt a responsibility and I came out on the other side, True Blue fan. I truly love what this franchise is and what it represents and what it can do. And I think it's a really wide bucket in terms of the ability to tell stories. I don't ascribe to the philosophy that Star Trek must be an episodic show for it to be good. I think there's all manner of Star Trek stories that can be told. Star Trek is a world and any kind of story can be told in that. That's why there can be movies. That's why there can be television. I would love to see a horror movie 
set in Star Trek. I think that would be really cool. How does a crew deal with, essentially, if you could do Alien on board Star Trek, how cool would that be? And I know that there was macrocosm and Janeway goes yeah. full Ripley on it and stuff. You can <laughs> do those. But that's what I love about the franchise itself is that even within the show, there is a, a myriad of genres that you can explore from comedy to horror. I mean, The Thaw is one of the most terrifying episodes of television I've ever seen. Michael McKean is amazing as fear. And I think it's one of Janeway's coolest, most badass moments. I think that the, the franchise is only as limited as our imagination of what it can be. I would love a hyper-violent, adult animated, heavy serialized Klingon Game of Thrones style show. <laughs> I think that would be incredible. To get to explore these different worlds and cultures, that's for me one of the most exciting parts about Star Trek. There is this myriad of things out there for us to explore. And there are so many fun tools that the previous writers have given us. For example, you hear mention of one species, like I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head, something that was mentioned in, in Next Gen. Whoa, you see the Cardassians like once or twice in Next Gen, right? They're interesting, but we don't really know much about them. We know there's a Bajoran war going on. And then you have the whole of Deep Space Nine anchored around that conflict. And I love that potential of getting to just seed an idea and then knowing that years later, some other writer is going to take that idea, get really excited by it, and create a whole recontextualization of what that is. The Breen, for example, were mentioned in one episode of Next Gen, and then they had a great arc at the end of Deep Space Nine, and they're terrifying. I think that that's one of the most exciting aspects about the franchise for me, is that you can take this small kernel of something that someone sort of wrote as a throwaway line, and that can spawn a whole civilization. And I think the diversity of the franchise in terms of storytelling is possibly more prominent than it ever was because Discovery is nothing like Lower Decks, Lower Decks is nothing like Prodigy and so on. I imagine Strange New Worlds will be different still when that appears. So it seems like they're really going with, let's explore different corners of this universe, whereas obviously Next Gen was great and then Voyager was just more of that and Enterprise is kind of just more of that in a way as well. And I think we also live in a different time as far as the structure of how studios work and how stories are produced and stuff. Outside of big network dramas and comedies, there aren't 22 episode seasons anymore of anything. And for good or for ill, they're probably not coming back. If you're talking about streaming, if you're talking about premium cable or anything like that, it's just not going to happen. Wanting that to return is a fool's errand, it feels like. As much as I would love a 22 episode season, because that means I'm working for like a year and a half straight, <laughs> I would also be super exhausted. But that's just not the model that the business is running with anymore. Again, for good or for ill, it's not a value judgment on it. It just is what it is. But yeah, I think it's really exciting. Prodigy, I think, is incredible. I love it. I'm so excited for everybody to see what's coming up. All the Star Trek shows have a person on point with another Star Trek show. Someone on Prodigy is reading all of Discovery's material. I'm reading all of Prodigy's material. Someone's reading all of Picard, et cetera, et cetera. So we all know what each other are doing so that if someone pitches something in the room, be like, actually, Prodigy is kind of going that. I'm so excited for everybody to see the rest of the season because it's absolutely incredible. Discovery's picking up elements from Picard with the Quatmalat and so on. Yeah, and the Sung Golem as well with Grey. Yeah, so there's all sorts. Yeah, it's interesting to hear it's all joined up in that way. I mean, it's siloed by the sounds of things, but it's not totally siloed. It all has to fit together still in some way. Yeah, if anybody's making like a big cannon swing or something like that, the showrunners all have their meeting a couple times a year that is like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is our general area. Are we stepping on anybody's toes? There's a lot more cross-pollination than I think people realize. Looping back to your job as a writer's assistant. So what does a writer's assistant do on a show like Discovery? What are your kind of main responsibilities and how do you feed into the episodes and things in that role? The primary duty of the writer's assistant is to take notes. You are there as an empty vessel to fill with words. So basically throughout the course of the day, people are talking, you are trying to catch what they're saying as verbatim as you possibly can, especially if it's the showrunner talking. So you're taking notes, you're processing all that information at the end of the day, and you're delivering a document that is essentially the cleaned up version of the 15 to 25 pages of notes that you get in any given day. So it's a, it's a real 12 hour job because those notes at the end of the day, sometimes, especially when we're in kind of the blue sky for episodes, when it's just infinite possibilities. What do we want to do here? What planet do we want to visit? 
those notes can get long because it's basically people are just throwing out stuff and it's just like, all right, I got to catch all of it. Got to catch all of it in case some of this comes useful because inevitably three, four, five months down the line, someone's going to be like, hey, do you remember when we were talking about this thing in 302? That can come into play now. Go find that thing that Alan said. And then the poor writer's assist is like, oh my God, I have to comb <laughs> through like all of this stuff. But I mean, that's the job, but it's great. And it's not the same in every room. Our room is very egalitarian in terms of the best idea rises to the top and everyone is willing to hear everyone no matter what their title is. I actually got a lot of stuff on screen in season three as a writer's assistant because I was at my computer and I had memory alpha at my fingertips. Someone would reference something. I could be like, oh, okay, what, what do they mean by that? We have two writer's assistants generally at any one time. So I would message them and be like, hey, I'm going to look something up on this. And they're like, okay, cool. I'll kind of take point. Someone would bring something up, want to know context, and then instantly present them with, okay, this is what the general canonical understanding of it is and all of that, which makes me look very smart. <laughs> and then now sitting at the big kids table, if I don't have my computer, I'm like, well, yeah, well, I remember in that Deep Space Nine, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I can't quite recall the titles and stuff like that with such facility that when I have the internet at my fingertips, which is, I guess, the advantage of the Zoom room is we have all our documents just sort of in front of us, which is kind of handy, but it's harder without boards. In terms of other responsibilities, we have boards in the room often. As we outline and pitch, we are putting things up on cards. We're often the ones who have to take those cards and transfer them into a document that then becomes the pitch document and stuff like that. We would often write recap at the end of the day. Michelle is incredible when it comes to this. She can basically walk in, hear some pitches, take like 30 seconds, and then distill everything that landed for her and just like rattle it all off. And that became very helpful for us because we would then just basically copy that verbatim and that became, this is what we landed on during the day. And so we'd kind of frame the notes off of that. It's wild to watch her work. Her memory is it's like a lockbox. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So what kind of stuff did you get on screen during season three? God, let's see. I'm trying to think of the specifics. Oh, well, there's a small thing and it's it would be a very hard thing to notice because it's a very small Easter egg, but it's the price of rodinium is going down in the first episode, which has to do with the coordinates in the second episode. I have a lot of little linkages in there. If you see enterprise references throughout the series it probably came from me probably not 100 percent, but i'm like the enterprise guy so if if you see those things in there in season four it was definitely between me and eric who wrote the episode but we were both talking about it and we were the ones who thought of the nx1 in the snow globe idea because the truth of it is burnham culber samitz saru all these people they don't give a shit about kirk they don't give a shit about picard they don't know these people You know who they do give a shit about? Archer. Archer was important to them. He's like their Abraham Lincoln. And so we thought that that was important to honor for our characters because it's canonically correct. He is the most prominent figure in their history. And so in season four, you see the Archer space dock and stuff like that. In season three, I'm trying to think of some of the other, it all sort of blurs together. Oh, the pattern buff. Oh, wait, no, that was season four. I was pretty sure the pattern buffer idea, me and Andrea Walsh were talking about relics. And that's where that came out of in the room was me and one of the writer's assistants talking about that. And I'm trying to think, I know there was more in season three, but it's it's sort of hard until I'm in there because it's, it's small things. It's like a line here and there that I will pitch in the room and someone's like, oh, write that down. That's a great little thing. It all feels so far away. <laughs> it feels like there's been 10 years between season three and season four. I know the feeling. Oh, Rin having his antennas chopped off. That came from me. And I have a really amazing little piece of art that Bowie Kim drew that I sent to Noah Averbat Cat, just a picture of it. It's just a little cartoon drawing of an Andorian with scissors and his little antennas being chopped off. And I was like, oh, it's the first concept art of Rin. I think making him Andorian was my pitch. I really wanted an Andorian character because we were featuring them so heavily as part of the Emerald Chain, but we weren't really having any characters that were Andorian. And so I thought it was important to have one featured at least once in the season that that we could sort of see whatever culture that he came from that he was either embracing or rejecting. And that's kind of, for me, one of the first questions I like to ask in our 32nd century because I think there's a lot more cross-pollination of cultures of people who are caught on planets during the burn and stuff like that is like, what culture were they born into or not born into? And are they embracing or reject? Because I think that that's a more 
helpful question than what species are they? Yeah. Because the truth of it is there are many of us that are born into a cultural context that isn't necessarily our own, or we end up moving or migrating to one, and we have to adjust to that. And I think it's important to understand what characters are embracing or rejecting about their heritage more than the bioessentialism that comes along with not just Star Trek, but I think any science fiction fantasy property that has humans in it. Because humans exists sort of as the straight cis white males of the universe. Everything is drawn in comparison to them. And so I think that in not wanting to create monolithic species, that's why that question is important, is, is a question of culture. And so that's, for me, what I always like to drill down on with characters when we're introducing new characters, is what are they embracing or rejecting? And hundreds of years after well, the 24th century how things changed. Yeah, I belong to a species thing really matter necessarily. I mean, mm -hmm. Rillick, for example, she's Cardassian, Bajoran, human. Is it just those three? Yeah, and we've never talked about the exact percentages, but in the room, it's human parent and Bajoran Cardassian hybrid parent. So she's one half human and then one quarter Bajoran okay. Cardassian is kind of the mix, which is why you see the more prominent human features in the lesser of the other two. Rillick was a super important way to represent that. And even though we haven't really dug into where the Bajorans and the Cardassians are in this future on screen yet, it was important for us to still acknowledge that and to have Rillick there representing a change, something different, something interesting within that context. And hopefully we'll get to explore all corners of the 32nd century, whether it's it on Discovery or other 32nd century spinoff shows, if we ever get anything like that. I think there's so much potential for exploring how things have changed on all these different worlds. And that's one of the most exciting things to me about coming in on this season was it did feel a bit like a blank slate or not really a blank slate, but it was like, here's what we were. Are we that in 900 years? I think that that's a really fun question to ask because some civilizations are going to change drastically and some are not. You look at the history of the civilizations in Star Trek and most of these civilizations governmentally haven't changed in millennia. Like the Cardassians, they've had the Obsidian Order since the 19th century. They've been living under fascist authoritarian rule the entire time that we've been in space. So just their secret police has outlasted several Earth civilizations. <laughs> I think that that's just really interesting to get to explore. And there's always these questions that come up in the room when we're starting to delve into these places. How have they changed? What conditions did the burn inflict on these people? It's just a really exciting place to work in. I'm grateful every day that I get to do it. Yeah, it does sound great. On to your episode, but to connect the mid-season finale, you got to close out the first half of the season. How did the sharing of the job go? How did you portion it out, different scenes or, or whatever? And how does that stay joined up? The way that we break in the room, we tend to work on two episodes at once. So they were working on really drilling down into the nitty gritty of 406, while half of our room is working on the blue sky of 407. Fairly early on, I kind of knew that this was going to be kind of bodily, very talking heavy episode because we just knew that within the context of the season, this was the episode where there was going to be a big galactic gathering and Book and Burnham were going to have their schism. So we knew that going in and that was the framework that we were building from. So we all sit in the room together and break the story. We sit and we talk and we kick the tires on things. People will pitch things and it's like, well, does that work? Okay, that seems like it works. Then we start working on the other story and then, you know, things start. It's hard to say what the roadmap was to it because it was just sort of like, you talk through it. Let's try to get this story out today. Then let's try to bang out the thing for this story. I was very vehemently in, in Stamets' camp in the, I feel like this is a very dangerous computer. This is dangerous to have on board. So a lot of that stuff came out of that. I actually wanted that whole scene to take place off Discovery because of the danger of Zora being able to listen to everything. But then what was born out of that, because there were actual production concerns that were like, no, we need to use our standing. We can't build a new set. We have to use the ready room for that scene. I was like, okay, Terry and I talked it over. And so we built that in to have Kovic say that having Zora participate is actually part of this thing. It was a production constraint that I think helped us in a lot of ways. So when we got to the actual writing of the episode, I took point on the Galactic Senate story, or the Galactic Forum, and Terry took point on the Zora story. 
I would send her my pages. She would send me hers. I would make notes, make changes. She would do the same. We'd send them back, rewrite, 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 put it all together, blend it, send that off to Michelle. She would read it, give us notes. We would rewrite and so forth and so on. And that's kind of the base of it in terms of how the episode came together. And that's typically when we have co-writes, one writer will take the A story and the other writer will take the B and C story. And then they'll blend it together. And obviously, they'll both work on both. But we have a week to get the whole episode written. So you take half, you take half, let's divide and conquer, and then we'll blend. And that seems to work pretty well for us, especially because my episode, those two stories are entirely siloed off from each other. Outside of the monologue at the end and the stuff at the very beginning, they don't really touch each other. And in fact, credit to Chad and Michelle, Chad Rubel was our editor for beautifully intercutting those because in the original draft, Terry and I, because we were writing them separately, we hadn't actually blended those two speeches. And then Michelle was like, hey, I think it would actually be really great if it was blended. Can you guys take a stab at that? And we took a stab at it. And I think, honestly, it's one of the best sequences of the whole episode is when the two speeches are being intercut. It's really emotional. And that was a thing that came out of a a note, a rewrite note. We were happy to get a note like that because it makes our episode better. Yeah. And they do connect thematically under trying to reach understanding or Mm -hmm. trying to promote understanding as well. So so they do fit together in that sense. But on a narrative level, they're completely different. What I found interesting about the gathering to discuss the DMA thing was how emotionally driven everything is. And I think that's more of a hallmark of modern Star Trek. And I think it's a good hallmark of modern Star Trek, where a lot of the narratives are character propelled rather than let's just talk about made up techno babble nonsense or whatever that doesn't mean anything to anybody. So it's just, you've got books saying this thing destroyed my home. And you've got Burnham saying, let's embrace our better selves on this one because we have to, because if we compromise our principles every time someone punches us in the face, then who are we? And mm-hmm. I think that's a great root of, well, it's Star Trek, isn't it? It's the, you know, in the future, even when our principles are tested, we'll stick to them. And I like that everything's formed around that because Book is a really vulnerable place. He's willing to give in to his baser instincts, his desire for revenge, all that stuff. And you've got Burnham saying, no, you have to be better. I really like that. I think that comes across really well in that plot. And not that I'm advocating for the strike first mentality that our country is so famous for, (laughs) but I think it was really important for us during that whole thing that even if we don't necessarily agree with Book's method, it was that neither of them were wrong in their own right. Book's very emotional plea, I believe in his heart, he knows he's correct. He's doing the most good that he can do in this moment. That's what he sees as the good that he can do. And I think it was really important for us not to place a value judgment on book because he is experiencing so much pain. You've lost your home world, you've lost your family, and you're having to sit here as politicians debate over whether to do something about it or not. What is the best method to do something about it when there is a method to do something about it? And I think that that's where the terrifying appeal of Tarka comes in. How much fun was it to write dialogue for Tarka because I love his manipulative streak, the way he just pushes all the right buttons with book to get what he wants. He's delicious. I love a villain. I love writing villains and especially villains that get to choose scenery. And Sean, he was fun to read on the page. Kyle Jero in 405 originated the voice that he had in the examples, but I felt like it was my episode that really started to give him a lot of shape and a little more depth. Not that Kyle didn't, but it was just now we're starting to see another side of him and really starting to see some of the motivation behind what he's doing. And I'm really excited for everybody to see all of the rest of Tarka because I think he's an infinitely fascinating character. Him and Book together are really good. Oh, yeah. They encourage each other in the wrong ways, I think. And that's fascinating. David, he is magic on screen. You put him in literally any scene with any actor on our cast, and our cast is already top-notch. I think they're so talented and so incredible, but Putting David in those scenes, the scene with Stamets, the scenes with Tarka, he just has this energy that brings everybody up. And I'm so excited to see more combinations with David. You guys are going to see some really fun dynamics throughout the season. I was particularly drawn to that because Tarka's first appearance, I tend to have a personal thing about overly arrogant characters. And that's obviously how he comes across in his first appearance. But you start to get that shade about the, I just want to go home. I come from another universe, and which universe is it? Who knows? Maybe you know, I don't know. There's a multiverse out there, and I'm from one of them, and I just want to get home. That seems sincere, but there is also a undercurrent of lack of sincerity to it. There's an edge to it. 
Yeah. He has an agenda. He clearly has an agenda and books going to help him get there, I think. So I really like that. And I love the emotional appeal as well. I think the approach to grief this season through book has been top notch. I lost my mother a couple of years ago. I'm sorry. Just illustrating that for the purposes of just whenever a grief storyline comes up in something, I'm glommed to it. I can't keep my eyes off it. And I think the way the book's story has been playing out has been great. The ups and downs, how he regresses as well, because I think that's the important part. You take a step forward and then there's two back and he's taking two back at this point where we are in the season. Yeah, I can't say much more on that because we're getting into spoiler territory. Of course, I don't want to know either. We got a wild ride the rest of the season and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Finally, I was just going to ask you about The Black Demon, this film that is (laughs) filming at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Is it a serious thing or is it silly like The Meg? Because it has both have a megalode on in it. (laughs) Okay, so here's the truth of it. I came in on an open writing assignment and did a page one rewrite of a not very good giant shark film. And... I wanted to make it a supernatural Aztec spirit sort of thing in the vein of ghost shark. I wanted to make a ghost shark, but made of oil. Now, I finished that open writing assignment and turned it in right before I went on to Star Trek Discovery. I got paid and I thought, this movie's not getting made. Then COVID hit and I'm like, that movie's definitely not getting made. (laughs) And then my manager calls me up a couple months ago and she's like, hey, so you should be expecting a check soon. I was like, what? She's like, well, the Black Demon is starting filming. I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, you were rewritten like four times, but you still kept a story by credit. (laughs) So (laughs) honestly, I have no idea what state the movie's in. I don't care because I got paid. (laughs) Nice. But when I wrote it, it was a family drama sort of horror about a family trapped on a small island that a supernatural shark is circling after an oil spill off the coast of a small fishing village in Mexico. But really, in actuality, the family were the monsters because they were all terrible people. And so it was sort of in that, are we the baddies sort of horror movie, but also with a giant oil shark. But again, I have no idea what state it's in. It's getting made, but that's sort of the nature of the business out here. I wasn't given any of the scripts, so I don't actually know the state of the movie right now. So it'll be a nice surprise when you see it. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. No, it seems like it'll be a great thing to uh, rent on demand on Amazon Prime for me. (laughs) We'll see what happens when it actually comes out. Cool. So final question is one that I ask everybody. If you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? I think about this a lot and I'm very ADHD. And so I think that I would have to take a very tightly controlled self-cloning thing so I could do many things at once because my brain is constantly divided doing many things at once. And it would actually be nice if I could get all those things done at once. Plus, it would be really great to just have a clone that cleans. That'd be useful. It's so good. And that's all it ever wants to do is clean. That's all it does. Yeah. So that'd be the superpower. That's a good power. I've not had that one before, so that's unique. Mm-hmm. So well done. You've come up with some unique. Thanks very much for your time. It's been of course, amazing it's talking to you about Star Trek and the writing process and the recent episode. We'd love to have you back on again for later episodes if you're ever involved in those, later seasons. Absolutely welcome anytime to talk more Trek. So really, thanks very much for your time. It's been fascinating picking your brain about these things. Yeah. That was my chat with Carlos Sisko. All the best to him for his future projects. If you like what you heard, then hit that subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Apple users, please leave a star rating and a comment. If you want to talk Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek in general, or anything else, then you can reach out on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, we hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod.